Hello, I'm Stefan Greber, the project leader for LexD, and still in our series of doing everything device related in LexD. Uh, this time around, we're going to be looking at InfiniBand. This is not a device type that's very likely to be used by most people, um, because most people don't run an InfiniBand network. Not that it's actually that difficult to do these days, or even that expensive. You can find a lot of uh, 40 gigabit InfiniBand hardware on eBay for very cheap. So if you're looking for very high throughput, low latency uh, networking, it can actually be interesting. Uh, but even, even then, most users of that kind of hardware will actually run the cards in Ethernet mode rather than InfiniBand mode, uh, as InfiniBand benefits are somewhat limited uh, and most people prefer to deal with Ethernet because you can bridge them, you can interact with them a bit more normally. Um, so yeah, if InfiniBand strength is really on super low latency and also on uh, supporting direct memory direct memory access, which is particularly useful in things like um, high performance computing, uh, where it's useful to be able to access the memory of another node in a cluster to to really reduce the amount of time where well the, the latency by not having to copy that data all across. These days, actually on very, very fast NICs, so if you're looking at 100, 200, 400 gigabit uh, NICs, most people run them in Ethernet mode. InfiniBand is not really much of a thing anymore. Uh, and instead, a technology called Rocky, which is RDMA, so Remote Direct Memory Access over Converged Ethernet, is kind of the, the replacement there, uh, which lets the card still operate in Ethernet mode but with uh, assistance as far as uh, prioritization of traffic uh, on the switches to give very similar uh, latency results as InfiniBand was providing, but without having to run a completely separate network. InfiniBand devices, even in InfiniBand mode, uh, can do a few different things. You can run them in just plain RDMA, so effectively you need to deal with the InfiniBand uh, network addresses, which are very long MAC addresses, to access other systems. Uh, with their memory access. There are a bunch of interesting libraries and software that can make use of that, and you can actually use that from within next to containers or VMs if you need to. Uh, the other thing you can do is turn on um, IP over IB. So that lets you do, as the name implies, in um, normal IP network connectivity over InfiniBand. That's not to be confused with Ethernet. Uh, so you do get to have IP addresses and you can run, uh, you can interact mostly normally through that, uh, but you're going to have a few weirdness. Um, the MAC address, as I mentioned, is particularly long, and anything that's expected to run at the um, Ethernet layer, so for example, you know, do things like doing DHCP, that's going to work potentially quite differently, uh, and not all software will deal with it just fine. But um, if all you're doing is kind of layer three type connectivity, just dealing with IP addresses, um, that can work just fine with IP over IB, and that's going to get you quite a nice throughput and low latency. All right, so on the LexD side, uh, we've supported InfiniBand for containers for quite a while, and we've added support for virtual machines, I think about a year ago now. Uh, we support two ways of dealing with them. So as mentioned, InfiniBand devices can't really be bridged. They're not Ethernet devices. Uh, so there's no way to do like um, a point-to-point VEF type device like we normally do for containers or a tab device for virtual machines, which reduces the amount of options you have as far as the NIC type. As a result, InfiniBand uh, devices in LexD support either physical, in which case the entire NIC is passed straight into the container or virtual machine, or SRUV is also supported for those cards that support SRUV and systems that can make use of it as well. Uh, it's worth noting that, I mean, the only vendor really from, for InfiniBand is Mellanox, uh, now NVIDIA, and as far as I know, pretty much all of their NICs support some amount of InfiniBand. Some of them might just support uh, 16, 32, or 64 virtual functions. Uh, the newer ones, I think, go all the way to 256, which is the PCIe limit. Uh, a lot of those cards are also dual ports, and you can actually change their uh, behavior on a per port basis. If you just buy one of those cards off eBay, uh, you're probably going to need to look quite closely at the firmware. Uh, there's like a f uh, official firmware tool from Mellanox that lets you go and redo the firmware configuration of the card. That's where you can decide which port runs in which mode. So you can decide to do two InfiniBands or one Ethernet, one InfiniBand, or both Ethernet. 
uh, and that's also where you can decide whether you want to turn on or, um, SIOV or not, and how many uh, virtual functions would be allowed up to the maximum the card can physically do. Once you've done all of that in the firmware, you need to reboot the system, at which point the Linux kernel driver can make use of that, and you can tell the kernel driver uh, how many VFs do you want to see activated now, and whether you want them to be tied to the Mellanox driver or not. That's important when you're dealing with a mix of containers and VMs, because for containers, they need to be tied to the driver. For virtual machines, they need not to be tied to the driver. So you need to kind of figure that out and, and find the right split for you. Anyways, um, other than that, things you can tweak. Uh, you can tweak the MTU, you can tweak the name, and you can override the MAC address. There is a note here that this is not a normal uh, MAC address. So um, you usually deal with the 20 byte variants instead of the, the short but the short 8 byte variant that you might be somewhat used to. Alright, so let's go look at the machine with an InfiniBand card. Um, so it's one of our test systems here. If we look at the listing specifically for Melanox, we can see a few things here. Uh, first of all, we've got two cards. Uh, you should ignore the bottom one. That's a dual 100 gigabit card uh, that does Ethernet only. So we're just going to ignore that. Um, the card we care about is the top one, and that's a dual 40 gigabit card, uh, half of which is running in Ethernet mode, the other half is running in Infinement mode. And it has been configured uh, to load with 16 virtual functions. That's what we're seeing down here. Uh, the way you can do that is uh, when you load the driver, uh, you, or you can override that in etc modprop.d, but you need to set number of virtual functions you want to activate and number of virtual functions you want to connect to the Melanox driver itself, so for use by containers. In this case, I've done 16 VFs and four are set up for containers. If we go look at IP link, it's going to be a bit of a mess. Um, so the Ethernet port on the card can be seen here. That's that ENP four uh, zero D one, and we can see that when you turn on um, SIOV uh, on the card uh, and you load the driver, the driver doesn't really know about the port, so it just applies the same policy on all of the ports. So in this case, it also turned on sixteen VFs on the Ethernet side. The video is about infinement, uh, so we're going to be ignoring that. And instead, uh, what we can see is I've loaded the um, IP over IB driver as well. So the master device for that one would be this one, uh, IPB, um, IBP4 as zero um, is the, the main device. And then we've got our four uh, devices down here that are connected to the driver. Uh, so those are the virtual functions. On top of that, we have another 12 uh, that are available, uh, but they're just available on the PCI level to be used by virtual machines. They are not accessible from the OS, so can't be used by containers. All right, uh, so that was a bit of an introduction there. Um, now on the LXD side, I've got a container and a virtual machine that's already created. Um, both of them are 2204. The only reason for pre-creating is in the VM, I've already installed a kernel that has the drivers. The default uh, kernel we use in our LXD images don't include all of the additional set of drivers you might have on a normal computer. And uh, obviously we don't include Infiniment by default, so I had to install the Linux generic driver and then reboot for the VM to have everything we need. So um, on the container side, uh, what we can try and do is do a device add. So on U1, uh, call the device IB0, the Type is infinite band, and we'll start with uh, nick type physical, so doing a full pass through. Uh, can call the device IB0, and the parent, which is the host type device, is I have no idea, so let me just fail that command and then do IP again to go look at that. And we need, yeah, so the parent device is this one, so let's do that. and Set the parent, add that, start the container, go in the container, and here we go. Uh, we've got uh, an InfiniBand device here that is up. We can see the extremely long MAC address that it comes up with. The other thing that's interesting with InfiniBand is the MTU is a bit higher than usual, and I believe you can also bump the MTU to very, very large values. I seem to remember 65K being something that's possible with InfiniBand. Uh, so depending on what you're doing on your network, if you need to send extremely large frames, uh, Infiniment can be pretty interesting, actually. Okay, so that's just 
pure pass through. That means the device now doesn't exist on the host anymore. It exists only in the container and that's it. That's what you might want to do if you don't have SRIOV or if you don't want to use it. That said, uh, if we stop the container and we go and remove the device, uh, there we go. We can add it back, but this time as SRUV. And so this time, instead of removing the device from the host and passing it through, it will pick one of the other four that we saw earlier and move that inside of the container. And we can see same result as earlier. We still have an infinement device. Uh, the, there's really no sign that it is the um, that it's a virtual function, but it is. I mean, there's technically one sign, which is the MAC address is not the same. Uh, so this is indeed a virtual function that has been passed. Now, on the VM side, we can do the, the same thing, but you could move the entire uh, card if you wanted. In this case, it's already in use, so not a good idea. That would fail, um, or if it didn't fail, that would just crash your entire system, so bad idea. Um, but the exact same thing with the SRUV can be done. So we can add V1 uh, to V1 to the VM, an infinement device as a SRUV, and start that. And this is and I boot up with an infinement device. Uh, ideally, I would I would have brought up the device uh, on both sides and sent some traffic between the container and the VM to show that this works. Unfortunately, infinement is not quite that simple. Uh, you need to have a switch somewhere to act as a, I don't remember, subnet manager or something like that. They call it in infinement uh, IP over IB. And I don't have one of those running. I've done it before in software. There's a software one you can install uh, from your distro and with a tiny bit of uh, configuration, will let you bring up the link in both container and VM and actually send traffic through. Most people who buy that kind of hardware, um, whether it's like actual production hardware or it's just stuff they buy off eBay, they will also get a switch because they're gonna have more than one, more than just two machines to connect, um, in which case the switch will act as that subnet manager and you'll be fine. Anyway, uh, if we go inside of the VM now, uh, I don't think I've got this PCI Utils installed yet, so let's just do that. There we go. And if we look at PCI Utils, we can see a Mellanox Connect X4 is connected, is added to the VM now. Um, out of the box, nothing will show in uh, IP link. That's normal. It's because the uh, infinement driver for IP over IB is not loaded by default. You just need to load that at which point you've got a nick here. Um, so just for kicks, we can try and bring that up. That should actually work. Uh, it will go up, but we see that the state, so the link is up, but the state remains down. And that will be the case until there's some kind of subnet manager uh, running. So even if I did uh, bring up the device on the container side, again, wouldn't be able to actually send anything through. Um, I just wanted to see just how high we can bring the MTU because I seem to remember that like the default we're seeing here at uh, 2044. I don't think that's the maximum. I seem to remember uh, it's supporting something a bit higher. Uh, apparently, maybe I'm wrong. Or maybe you need to do some other tweaking to turn on higher MTUs in InfiniBand because it looks like as it stands, it only lets me lower it. It doesn't let me go past uh, 2044. Uh, it is obviously a larger MTU than is normal on Ethernet, but not by much. And I seem to remember that um, that this is a thing that can be significantly tweaked in InfiniBand. But it could be that uh, more is needed or that you do need the um, the manager running to be able to negotiate that kind of stuff. Anyways, um, that's a quick look at InfiniBand. So effectively, two con a container and a virtual machine, both using uh, SRUV uh, virtual functions coming from a... Um, a pretty cheap uh, infinement device. I don't know what they sell for these days. I believe I got this card for less than 100 bucks um, quite a few years ago now. So I wouldn't be surprised if you could get your hands on like a dual port 40 gig infinement card for something like it's anywhere between 20 and 50 bucks these days. So that can be interesting. Um, maybe the one thing to keep your eye, an, an eye on is that uh, the, the newer cards are running our ConnectX6s. That's what I've got here. ConnectX7s uh, exist as well. Um, and so Mellanox will probably, I'm not sure how long they're going to be really maintaining the ConnectX3 driver. 
Uh, so just look around. Definitely, I wouldn't go with ConnectX2. I would look at X3 as a minimum um, and maybe look at ConnectX4 if you can find um, one of those to just be slightly on the safer side driver-wise so you don't end up buying some, some hardware that goes fully end of life, not supported with the driver like rotting or being removed. That would be my, my one advice there. Um, Anyway, hopefully that was quite interesting. I don't think many people really get to to look at or play with Infiniband. Um, so that's an interesting glimpse into some other ways of doing networking uh, that is not just your, your standard Ethernet networking. If you've got any questions about this, uh, feel free to leave them down below in the comment section, or you can go on our community forum and I'll be linking the documentation we have for this. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.